Welcome to another episode of our mini podcast, I Built a Company That Makes a Difference by B1, where we talk to founders of sustainable businesses to get their takes on how and why they started their companies and the lessons that they've learned along the way. Today, my guest is Jen Harper, the founder of Cheekbone Beauty, which is the first indigenous owned and founded cosmetics company. Cheekbone's aim is to make a difference in the lives of indigenous youth through donations that support educational opportunities for them and to create a space in the, in the beauty industry where everyone, including indigenous people, feel represented and seen. Jen, you're the first indigenous founder that I've had the opportunity to speak to on this podcast, and we're now in season three, which, yeah, wow. I'm so pleased to be able to hear about you and your journey and Cheekbone Beauty. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here. Wonderful. Can we just start by you giving us a little bit of background about yourself? Sure. So first off, I'm a mother, a wife, a daughter, a sister, a community member, uh, and I think lover of all things that come from nature. And I'm the founder of a color cosmetics company, which, you know, is it landed me here in this conversation with you, but was not um, the career path or uh, direction I felt my life was going when I was younger. But but here we are. Where? How did you? What was your aspiration when you were younger? Sadly, I I don't think I had big aspirations. Um, I am the product of a family of like trauma, generational trauma, uh, and it's actually a, a really big part of the the cheekbone beauty story, but um, found myself on a, a healing journey and then ended up having a dream with three native little girls or indigenous girls covered in lip gloss and woke up from that dream and grabbed my laptop and literally wrote out what is the foundation of our brand today and that was to create a product at the time it was just a lip gloss and use a portion of the profits to do something to support our community um and it, it's really interesting because i'm really open about saying like i'm in a space where i feel like i absolutely do not belong and and didn't know a lot about but have learned a ton over the last eight years for sure so cheekbone is is eight years old now yeah, so that dream was in 2015, and then we didn't launch technically in is a store like an e-commerce store until November of 2016, um, and so I'm you know, and then I didn't leave my full time job until August of 2019 because we got an investment, and so yeah, it's been quite quite the path, but I, I always feel like I didn't go all in until 2019. So I always, you know, it's kind of be like, where do we start? But it's essentially started in January of 2015. Can you, that's, I, so I read that you had that dream and I was like, wow, that is like, that's amazing. That's an amazing start. It wasn't just like something that you wanted to do. It wasn't a hobby on the side. You, You literally had a dream about a thing that you were to put into the world. That's amazing. Can you talk to us about what it was like between 2015 and 2019 when you jumped all the way in? What were those years like? What were you doing? What was it to build the company? What was your first, after you wrote down your foundation of your brand, what was the next step? Yeah. So when I look, when I think back, it, it, it's kind of a wild time because it's, it, it's really a bit of a blur. I was like on felt like full speed ahead when you have a full-time day job and then you're doing this on the side i i feel like i was definitely working like 80 100 hour work weeks because i was and you have kids yeah working two jobs um and i just started to do whatever i possibly could to one learn about entrepreneurship i was researching this industry and discovered that so many beauty brands start, or now I'm recognizing industry-wide, like multiple industries, having a product put into the world is not the hard part because we have globalization and we have, you know, private white label manufacturing. So anywhere around the world, essentially, a product can be born and a brand's logo can be put on that. And and people then can call themselves a business or a brand. And so learning that pretty early, I was like, well, this is crazy because it just seems so simple. Like, 
anyone can do this. And then I recognized, okay, yeah, that's why most people's businesses fail. One, because you're not even entering a market with a competitive edge, right? Um, and then secondly, what I was learning in particular about the beauty space is this whole idea of like, you know, product market fit and like really being what's your differentiator in the space? Like, what it, are you bringing something innovative or u- unique into the beauty industry? And I'm like, well, this way is not really going to do that. But what it did allow someone like me to do was actually start a brand and see if there was actually a market for it, right? Because otherwise, I was like, well, one, no one's ever going to give me investment. I'm a nobody. I'm not a celebrity. I'm not an influencer. um, And I didn't even have my own money to do this. And so there's no way a bank would be like, yeah, sure, you were working in the food. I was actually selling seafood at the time. That was my job. And I was always in the food sector or food industry. And I was really sure that there was no way a bank or any investor would give me money without proof of concept. So I knew I had um, this time period to actually see if something was possible. So sought out sort of the best private white label partner I could find in, and they happened to be here in Canada. And then we launched just a couple products and it was like a couple months into the brand where we were already gaining like so much attention. It was so strange. It was almost like there was such an appetite or thirst for a brand like ours to exist. And what our brand really was at the time was just an indigenous owned brand because you right, those products are not unique. Nothing we were doing was unique. Um, And in 2017, we were in like a first beauty led article out of a a publication Canada called Flair magazine that was here for many years and beauty editors had discovered the brand. And I remember having to go tell my boss from my seafood job, oh, by the way, I'm doing this thing on the side because I knew that this article was coming out and yet they were totally fine with it. Thank goodness. I was like, this is just like my weekend thing. I'm, you know, working on this, this little brand or this little project. And then I started to get so many questions from customers in that first year as well. Like, what's in the products? What are these ingredients? Where are they sourced? Where is everything manufactured? Where does the packaging come from? Like, do you understand and recognize the sort of issues with plastic and 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 all kinds of questions that, quite honestly, I could not answer because we're we're, we're sourcing this from someone else. And then when I would try to do some research with with our partner and investigate, I would be completely ghosted, which left me feeling like there was they were hiding something um, and not being truthful about everything. And and sure enough, was learning lots of things about ingredients and even where a bulk could be made and then filled in a different country. All kinds of like crazy stuff that you d- 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 didn't know existed in the space, and. I just became like a sponge for those first few years and learned everything I possibly could and understood that for this brand to be successful, we would definitely have to go down in a completely different path, which meant creating our own formulations and how is that going to be possible? Wait, so, wait, when, how far along in the journey did you realize that? Like, okay, this is a thing. I'm working on the brand, the product part of it. Somebody else is taking care of too. <laughs> oh no, I need to do everything from end to end. That's a huge, that's a big shift. How far into the journey did you realize that? It was a, a less than a year. And oh, then, wow. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and within that year and then a year and a half, I started working on the plans of like how what I would address that. So I started seeking contract chemists and then learned about co-packing manufacturers. Cause at first I was like, do I have to build a manufacturing plant? Like, I don't know anything about manufacturing, like all of these crazy, insane things. And the really interesting part, which I I always find funny, which people about my story in particular, I'm married to somebody who's in in, um, a biotechnology industry and in regulatory and compliance. And so never in a million years would I ever make a product in my kitchen, which I know a lot of people start there, but that would just like not fly in our home like the the safety measures and issues were just like extraordinary because you could youtube how to make a lipstick or a gloss and you can do it in your kitchen like well enough but then i'm like you know then you you get into the compliance issues and it's just not something that we were that i knew would would be happening in our home and so 
I learned that you can contract chemists, then you can outsource or co-pack manufacturing. And then, so these were like all of the small steps I started to take and um, really worked on our first formulation that probably started in, in the beginning of like 2019, still without the investors. Uh, and we started meeting with them in the beginning of 2019 as well. But it, and like, while you're working on like building the company, you're I'm also working on changing these formulations and figuring out how to do that. And then trying to come up with a number because these investment partners wanna know how much do you think this is gonna cost, right? Like, and I have no idea. And so you're trying to figure out, like if we if we did outsource everything and we're able to do this with contractors, it's surely gonna be much less of a cost than going all in. And um, it's how we started and then really quickly recognized, okay, without the ability to have the chemist on our team and not have a lab where we're actually watching what's happening to ingredients and formulations that it, this is going to take forever and feel mm. like next to impossible to launch the amount of products that we knew we wanted to to launch and so with the support and finally with the investment we hired chemists and built a lab at our headquarters in St. Catharines and we still at that time were like three people like someone packing orders me doing everything and having someone in the finance side of things supporting the business so still so small but just really knew that to be different in this industry you cannot rely on these partners and this is what the beauty world does they go to the trade shows they meet these um private white labelers and you know then they are be like yeah and it's what every celebrity does they'll they, they're like acting like they're in their own labs no they're in the lab of the co-packer and the co-packer has formulations that they've had for generations and years and sure someone could come in and be like yeah use this new ingredient and they can test that new ingredient with input it in but really that the, these are formulations that have already existed for multiple years and many businesses and brands actually use the same the same formulations in in all of their products what we wanted to do differently was obviously figure out what is this world of clean beauty actually mean because they're again globally there's nobody yeah, that's no standard that term yeah. it's just a marketing term and then you have all of these different organizations from around the world that say they're doing all these things but it's all done in a different way and what we had to do as a brand is actually like sit for months at a time and just decide who we wanted to be because are you a clean brand? Because sometimes if you are, that doesn't mean you're paying attention to naturally derived ingredients because a lot of clean ingredients can be made in a lab. And and not that there's even anything wrong with that. I'm just like saying that, or if you're choosing sustainability or can you be both and can you be vegan and all of these, like there were so many factors and we sat down for months to decide who we wanted to be and what we wanted to be is a brand that completely represented my culture and one because i've been public about saying this but i believe indigenous people are the ogs of sustainability if you look globally around the world and at my own culture in particular i come from the ojibwe nation or ojibwe tribe and we're a, a part of people called the anishinaabe people we've lived around the great lakes in north america for thousands of years and there's teachings that come from our culture that literally speak to these things and it's how our people have behaved and it's and it, it's really interesting because I, I kind of always question them like well why are my people like this and I've just discovered that it's like this innate cultural way of being and living that because even myself I was like why have I always been just obsessed with nature and 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 then starting this brand I can tell you those first few years felt heavy because I wasn't doing things the way that I knew I wanted to. I just didn't have the money. And, and that was the actual reason to, to do things in this more sustainable version. And so we spent that time and we really created Cheekbone Beauty. It's based on my indigenous roots and we own the term, we're sustainable by nature. And now we create products um, from formulation to end of life that are leaving less of an impact on the planet and, and not harming humans or any anything living along the way. And that's the whole mission of the brand and really thinking about this 
on such a deep level that we think about when you wear our makeup and you go on a lake, is that ecosystem going to be impacted? Or when you wash your makeup, if often it's going down or drain and back into an ecosystem. So just recognizing that there's a lot of ingredients that have been made over the years, um, that the first, their first mission of that ingredient was not, is it gonna affect aquatic life? It's like, can we make long wearing products basically, right? Which many brands, uh, claim and is in fact true, but it's because of the chemical that was created to make that long wear actually now impacts um, nature in a negative way. And so like those are the sort of the the balances that we have to shift as a society if we want to think about doing things differently and really focus on protecting our planet, then we have to think of like every level of of how something's made. And that's it's it's not easy. And I again I don't ever think the onus should be 100 percent on the consumer. It definitely needs to be on brand to be able to describe and define like we did for those months of what kind of brand you are and who are you and are you just going to be clean are you just going to be vegan um you know because it's 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 mind-blowing how as a and i'm at fault because there's so many things i believed as a consumer because a brand was saying it and learned along the way that they are in fact not true that these were really simplified multi uh, marketing terms that in fact are so nuanced and so um, vary from ingredient to packaging to all of the things that it's it's so complex that as a consumer, unfortunately, we have to just ask a lot more questions of the, the, the people creating the brands and the people making the products. Oh my goodness. So every time, not every time, but almost every time I get to talk to an entrepreneur, especially on this podcast, a sustainable entrepreneur, I learn about another way, either that the planet is being harmed that I didn't even realize was happening, or another um, another item in my everyday life that I could swap out for something else that I, I didn't realize. And I'm not a big makeup wearer anyway, but I had never really thought about that. And that sounds weird. I mean, shampoo, conditioners, face cream, you know, but, but actually cosmetics, I didn't really think of that before. Um, before we, we set up our discussion, I, I hadn't, it hadn't really, it hadn't really crossed my mind. And when I think about, you know, my bathroom and I've gone to lengths to say, okay, I don't want any plastic in my bath, you know, getting rid of the shampoo bottles and getting rid of this. And I, I want, I've traded everything for bars as much as possible. You know, I, I somehow, maybe because my makeup bag is not actually physically in my bathroom, I've kind of <laughs> skipped over cosmetics altogether. Um, but if you're also, you're not an avid makeup user, so it's probably something you're not going to think about on a regular basis. Right. So um, yeah, it's part of it. And, you know, on a, truly on a small scale is someone swapping out that one item going Mm -hmm. to impact anything well it's the multiple people that are gonna Mm -hmm. do that right and that's why i mean i love these communities because it's it's not a one person plan it's definitely a, a global effort so can you talk to me about the educational opportunities the other side um, that was really important for you. Actually, I have two questions. No, I have a thousand questions, but two <laughs> right now, and they're not related either. So the first one is, I'd love to know more about the educational opportunities that Cheekbone is affording members of your community, especially girls. And the other question is, you know, when you decided to sit down and spend months on end defining exactly what your brand was going to be and what it was, what values you were going to live and how you're going to make it possible and you decided to bring chemists in and get more involved in the manufacturing how long and I'm, I'm saying this for the benefit of our of our entrepreneurs who are listening how long did it take for you to get from definition of of what that was going to be to the actual i'm thinking it's incremental and you you just to set expectations of it's not like one day you decide yeah. mm, i'm going to do this and then tomorrow you can go make it happen so what was that process like so those are two very different and non-related questions Yeah. First question. It's so interesting because that's the reason we started the brand, right? It was like, how can I support my community? I had no idea what that looked like. In this process, we actually were like, oh, okay. It's not going to be just about putting a lip gloss in the world and using a portion of those profits 
to do something uh, helpful to my indigenous community, it's almost like I learned that that's what we wanted to do, but then had to go backwards because we're like, okay, these products are not the products I want in the world. And so it didn't make any sense for us to be this social impact business without fixing sort of everything, which did take a really long time. And I had to be really patient with myself because um, that's hard as an entrepreneur, you want to make these changes. And it's just, it's completely unaffordable and unattainable without, without uh, time on your side and, and dollars. And that comes in, in, pro in, in a, a slower process as well. So first had the dream, the, in the really important part to my story is I was learning. So in Canada, we had this thing come out in 2015, the same time I had this dream called the truth and reconciliation commission. This was a final report written by the Canadian government and survivors of this system that was called the residential school system in the, or the boarding school system in the United States. Mm -hmm. So in North America, when um, Europeans came here to colonize, they recognized that, wow, there's a whole bunch of people living here and we're going to need to figure out what to do with them. And these boarding schools and the school system was created by church and state to really eradicate us and our culture as a people. It was really designed to assimilate us into a more European way of living, um, even though we were quite frankly very happy before Europeans came here. Um, but what that system did is, is maybe it sounds like a normal boarding school, a lovely school system. It wasn't. Um, these My grandmother survived that as well as my grandfather. My grandmother, which in my language is called my Kukum. Uh, she was taken from our family, her family at six years old and forced to live there till 16 and no going home in between on the nothing like there was no contact. There's no um, exchange of love. She would see cousins, siblings, you're not even allowed to hug them in that school. They were malnourished, they were beaten. Um, and they would be punished for speaking our language Anishinaabe Moen. And so that final report literally it was 500 and something pages. I started reading it. And as a 38 year old woman living in Canada at this time, I had no idea that this is what happened to my people and my culture and my community. I was, we were, no one was ever taught this after my grandmother survived this. She never wanted to speak about it ever yeah, again. Okay. And so wow. we, I learned this term in these few years. And so a very important part of my backstory in November 26 of 2014, two months before having this dream, I got sober. So I had been battling alcoholism for so many years and then understand that, oh my God, like learning about the residential school system and my grandparents' experience was just like an aha moment because it's like, okay, I'm not just a screwed up person that has an addiction issue here. This is called generational or it's called generational generation transgen intergenerational transgenerational trauma. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So learn that then have this dream and this business. And then I was like, okay, well, I learned this about like, and I know so many people don't know about this happening. How can I create this business that feels like I'm going to do some good for my community that have obviously been so traumatized and really thought, okay, it's, you know, paid attention to brands like Patagonia and Tom's Shoes at the time, which I was like, there is social impact businesses. And is it possible we could do something in the beauty space with this? And these were all just sort of the seedlings. And really, it's, it was, it's, but it had become a very personal journey as well, because people say, like, nobody has a dream and then says, yeah, I'm starting a beauty company and is selling fish. Like, at the time, I think my family was like, not saying anything. I, I recognize now, maybe because I was sober, they're like, okay, she thinks she's building this beauty company. Let's just let her keep working on that. And thankfully they did. Cause I think sometimes our loved ones, family and friends can maybe sort of knock our dreams down because they're worried or concerned that we'd be wasting time and money. And gratefully mine saw it in a different perspective at the oh, time, which great. really worked out for the favor of me and cheekbone beauty but that is such an important part of my personal story and how the brand came into the world because I think without that the brand doesn't exist and then recognized oh I was learning so many things about how within our communities there is such a lack of funding there's this whole misconception that indigenous people get a free education and they're they have all these sort of free rides so to speak because of all of these sort of misconceptions about 
truth and reconciliation and what the government's doing to support people. And I was learning that a lot of that's not true. And one way I really felt in my gut that could truth truly help a young person was education and and being able to be in control of the sort of the the next part of your life that you wanted to create and so I was like that's what we could use for a portion of the profits and it didn't happen straight away the um our scholarship fund we weren't able to launch that until 2021 but in the meantime the first few years of cheekbone beauty we had donated um money to so many different causes that support indigenous youth and in particular one was called Shannon's Dream and this was about a young lady who just saw again the the schools that were off reservations were getting all this funding and schools on reservations were was it was very clear the inequality um so she created this thing called shannon's dream and we were donating to that for years and then really proudly the dream was always to have a scholarship fund and by 2021 we were able to launch that and so we gave out five scholar uh five scholarships last year in 2022 we just gave out 10 for 2023 and in that first year we gave out one so we've given out 16 which is incredible that's that's amazing part of what we wanted to do with the brand then we're in this space and as i i shared it's like i'm learning that i'm like okay i can't even just put this product into the world because i am not happy with that part um and so we were able to transform the entire brand by the end of 2021 and um thankfully our investors believed in this mission of sustainability along with us and they were we're still working together today to just continue to try to develop products that are better for people and the planet and along the journey became a b corp certified company as well in 2021 Oh my gosh. So you had a huge, hugely emotional year in 2015. Oh yeah. That must have been, I mean, there were so many things going on there for you in your personal life. So holy cow, that all led to you founding this company in but that's when I feel like I honestly really believe that it's like we have a path and a journey it's just takes some of us maybe longer to find it right and you know it's not always our fault if you do grow up in trauma there's reasons why you don't get to that path sooner but um you know i love sharing that i'm an older entrepreneur because age you know is just a number and who knows when you're going to find the path that you want to be on i i 100 agree with that it's well all of it not especially but and the uh the older entrepreneur part which is I'm I'm so uh, grateful every year. You know, every year that I live and every birth, I feel like I'm becoming more of myself, and I'm so grateful for that. And I think it's um, the the wisdom that you acquire, not just from just from life, right? Everything, and it goes when you are building a business, and it's such a unique experience. And if you haven't done this, it's really really hard to explain or talk to people. You know, things like these are all of the things that are going on in my mind right now. And this is the (laughs) cognitive burden that, you know, this is what's going on. This is why I don't sleep. Or, you know, this is why I I absolutely love what I do. Or this is why your problem of, you know, somebody ate my lunch in the lunchroom and you work at a corporate. I I can't relate to that anymore because I'm trying to, you know, do this over thing over here. So, but I feel like all of it um, is really building a company is really served by that experience. So I also relate to being an older entrepreneur. I think it's, you know, it's, it's to use an investment, it's bankable for sure. Um, It's really an asset. 16 scholarships, you know, we, I'm, I'm sitting here in London, but I, I do, I am American. So 16 scholarships, knowing the price of, of university in North America, that's a big, big deal. That's a, that's a big impactful deal. We want to, you know, we want this just to keep growing, like to, to be here to support as many people that are working on that, their education journey as possible. I just feel like it's so important. And what's really interesting, last year, we got over 350 applications of maybe five, I would have said no to if that, like if I had to pick, Mm -hmm. but there were, which just, again, proved to us as an organization that there's such a need for Mm -hmm. for more, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, because the things these young people are working on, 
would blow like i'm i'm just like this is incredible like look at this this talent look at the drive look at the vision of these young folks and working on sort of the world's next big problems and wanting to be a part of changing so many things uh it's you know it's really inspiring and what a like i feel like what a blessing to be able to have changed my life to now be on this path and that this be my job. I feel sometimes like one of the luckiest people ever to wake up. And it is, like you said, it's so stressful. It is a roller coaster ride, but I, I don't know. I would never choose anything else anymore. Like this is it, right? I can imagine that. So one thing that drives a lot of entrepreneurs, most of it, if not all, is sense of purpose. Like this thing that I'm spending my time, my energy mentally, my emotions and my money building and trying to put onto the world, I believe that the world would be better with this thing in there. Um, and it's very, very rarely, if ever, at least in my experience, talking to entrepreneurs and in this community, something that's like, well, I'm just going to, it's going to be super easy. I'm going to make money. And then that's going to be it. So really believing in the purpose that you have and, and what you're building, because it, there are some times that you're like, what the heck am I doing? And your whole family, in my case, my husband is like, what the heck are you doing? Yeah. Um, and you've got to figure out or go back That's to your purpose. <laughs> that you say that. Um, my daughter, who is in her first year of business school at the University of Toronto, um, we were on vacation last summer before she started school. And she was reading Shoe Dog while we're on our trip and she finally gets to the end of it and literally expressed how much she understands now my life because ah. how many times when it was blue ribbon shoes or whatever he had called it back then like he had lost the company almost like how many times and she can she constantly hears me i'm like it's over we have no <laughs> <laughs> like that has happened over these last few years on numerous occasions and it's so interesting how it would take someone to read a book about the building of nike before they fall Fully understand your story but like you said unless you're living it and doing it you don't understand at all yeah and it's not for lack of trying either sometimes your family is like i really want to understand you're acting like a yeah. crazy person please explain <laughs> what's going on and yeah. yeah it's hard to it's hard to know i've also hired a lot of people or been part of hiring people from corporates who've never worked in, in a startup or been entrepreneurs who look at it and they think, oh my gosh, I have so much creativity. I want more freedom. Uh, my talents are being wasted here at this corporate because they're just stifling me. And then they come and it's like, oh God, this life is not for me. This is, I didn't, <laughs> yeah. this is not what I thought of. And even in the, you know, the process for recruitment, you can explain with words as much as you possibly can, but you, you can't know until you're in it. No, and legitimately about 50% of the people that think they can in those interviews are no longer at Cheekbone as well. Right? <laughs> right. And no one knows unless you're in it. And yeah. But I'm, I'm really like, I'm dramatic when I'm telling them how awful it is some days, right? Like in the sense that like, you're going to be doing one job and then I'm going to come in and I'm going to tell you to do this whole thing like another thing and there's going to be others like I'm, and I'm trying to describe like the most dramatic of days that could possibly be and then you, you you do learn pretty quickly some people yeah they think they don't want this corporate life but I'm like that is the the nice quiet comfortable life that you probably dream of being back at now <laughs> yeah exactly the stability yeah. the yeah forecasting the knowing what's coming up yeah it's uh well so can you describe what cheekbone looks like today for from an operational point of view yeah so we um are available in sephora canada so sephora is the world's biggest oh that's huge store. yeah yeah that's a really big deal we we started online with them in 2021 and now we've grown to being in 61 doors in canada and they just have over 100 in canada um obviously sephora us is sort of our next big goal but in the sure. united states we're in jc penny in the 608 doors of that um organization which is also a you know a big feat and dramatic because it's it's so many doors um it is dramatic so we've grown uh quite quite a bit and then we've always had you know a really healthy e-commerce business at the same time as our retail distribution partner so i think a big 
pivot and struggle for me. I'd never been in retail, so I have no experience of working with retailers. And that was, oh, wow, such a learning curve. They all have their own culture and language, and you're really trying to figure out how to support them best. And Mm -hmm. many of these organizations are so used to working with big brands that have all the I think all the budget in the world I guess Mm -hmm. if you will from for marketing spend and and those things and so we've really had to learn uh, a whole new way of doing business and working with Sephora and JCPenney over this last we just launched in JCPenney by the end of 2023 was that like finals and that just started mid 2023 so that is very very new I'm going to their HQ for the first time uh, in May to meet with their teams just talk about new products and what's happening and how we can we can grow with their organization um but that was yeah a big tough learning curve for sure because our brand has such a big story um and a really unique position but from a merchandising situation that's really hard to yell from a shelf right it's like how do you create brand awareness and so thankfully we have the world of social media that helps us a ton to create um buzz around our brand and and we now live in a world where it's all about influencers and what brands are talking about so we're playing in all those things but uh, it's so interesting we get tons of questions about marketing and i always feel like it's something cheekbone is good at but um there's no like one answer like this is a ever evolving, rapidly changing situation. And we're talking day to day. And we know as a marketing team at Cheekbone that, you know, we could have a plan for what we're going to talk about and post, but if something in pop culture comes up and changes, like those changes will happen. And so, um, and it's a very layered approach like it's not just social media marketing it's your website it's it's your you know what what are you putting in google ads are you spending any money in meta is that working for you is that or is email marketing the play like there's so many layers of marketing that um what your pr like there's just so much constantly and it's constantly changing so i feel like sometimes we're a marketing company because that's like our focus all the time is like how are we creating the brand awareness and that's what we spend a lot of our time at as a small business we have to because we have to create that buzz around brand you're right and it for a company that is so brand led and your story and your narrative is so important to the dna of the company but you are in a mega crowded space so on a shelf, well, massive, what is the yeah. difference? How do you, so you rely on your, the marketing to drive people to, I mean, it, that's fantastic that you're in Sephora and, and JCPenney. Those are two big brands. Um, one, I'm so, I mean, I'm a, I'm a marketer by trade and I'm so happy when people kind of acknowledge like marketing is really complicated and it's really tough and it is ever evolving. Um, cause I feel like the profession has been so dismissed for such a long time. Um, but what, for the benefit of our audience, what are some learnings for a direct to consumer brand that's really looking to pursue a relationship with bigger retailers? Um, what, if you could do that process all over again for the first time, what would you have liked to know? Yeah, I definitely would have liked to have a much deeper understanding of their expectation. Okay. And I guess, you know, you always think of best in class in terms of the relationship with with these retailers. Um, And I just think having a deeper understanding. The problem with being the founder and the entrepreneur is you're just so hungry to make that work that you will say yes. And I feel like we might have said yes too early, Mm -hmm. just being like 100% honest. Mm -hmm. Um, Like, I think you need to, one, have the right amount of investment to be able to partner properly with these organizations because what their system involves is what in the world we call pay to play so once you become a partner of a retailer they need your money that goes towards your marketing budget to still grow in their locations as well and so it's it's all the planning in the forecasting that goes around how much you're ready and willing to spend whether it's you know i think for sephora it's loyalty programs and sampling programs and um you know, uh, marketing initiatives with their sort of influencer world. So these are all places where big, big dollars are spent. 
Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And if you're not a brand that's capable of that, then the retailer is probably not going to favor you. So do you want to spend your money to be in there to eventually be kicked out? And then you get what is called an RTV where they return all your product and quite potentially that could put you out of business. So Mm. you really need to understand the world of retail and it's very cutthroat. It's not always the nicest, right? So, cause they're businesses, they want to make money. And if your brand doesn't do that for them and I think what I now fully understand, it is the brand's job to sell the product off the shelf and the retailer, the retailer is not going to do that for you. Now, that's a very interesting learning. That's a good one to know. And then what about the importance of maintaining and continuing to grow your DTC channel? Super important. We learn the most from, you know, the data that surrounds our community that comes to us first and is, and we have the closest relationship with them. And I think it's such a critical relationship and so important for you as a brand to see where you're growing. And, you know, we know data helps us make decisions and decisions are expensive. And so the more that you own and understand your customer, which is coming to your your platform, you will be able to just make better decisions based on whether it's product development, marketing initiatives, all the things, right? You, you want to know what is what people care about that are coming into your world. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Can we get to our rapid fire, which never end up being rapid? And thankfully, because our guests usually have fantastic uh, insights. So one was the first one. Can you talk to us about the biggest success you feel like you've had today in the life of, of cheekbone beauty? Yeah. I mean, I feel like there's so many, to be honest, I'm really grateful, but obviously being able to fulfill that mission of supporting our community with scholarships, um, that was like the original goal. And so being on that path to being able to do that is huge and something I'm so, so proud of. Yeah. That's a really special one. Especially, I agree about the power of, of education, especially for, uh, especially for girls. What about the flip side to that question, which is your biggest failure to date? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, try to never look at it that way. <laughs> Cause I think it helps me survive <laughs> saying I've learned a lot. We've made so many mistakes and, you know, for me personally, I always felt like before I was 38 years old, I could call that a big failure because I was battling an addiction and made so many stupid decisions. And, um, you know, like on a personal note, that to me feels like the one of the biggest failures of my life, but how I've been able to flip that into being the person I am today. And, and without that life, I wouldn't be who I am today. And so it's helped me see the world differently, which I feel is, is so incredible. Wonderful. And what about the most important lesson you feel like you've learned to date? Yeah, you know, I feel like I'm not the best communicator. Um, and so trying to do a better job of understanding different communication styles, especially as a leader. I'm, I'm, I don't feel like I'm the greatest at the, this part of the job. Um, and so I want to just become a better communicator because I feel like I'm, I'm not good at that. And so the lessons I've learned when I haven't communicated clearly or haven't understood clearly, um, it has caused, you know, issues or problems within the organization or the business. And so I just want to get better at that. Oh, that's super. That's really interesting. Nobody has said that before. And now we're on season three and nobody has said that before. Uh, Last one. If you could get 85% of the world to adopt a single behavior, what would that be? The the idea of asking more questions is really powerful because it opens up your mind to different perspectives, but also will this help us create some solutions for all the problems that we're facing right now? So if we just all started, instead of just like, I feel like one of the world's biggest problems right now is um, misinformation and, um, you know, actually false or like lying narratives on the internet, essentially, right? Or in uh, social media, which has could cause wars or have they, do we, you know what I mean? So I feel like 
asking more questions and being a lot more, um, it, you know, just thinking deeply and differently about everything and mm-hmm. questioning everything. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us where to find you, your website, your socials? You already said Sephora in Canada, JCPenney's in the U.S. Let us know. Where can we, where can we go check you out? So I'm Cheekbone Jen on most of the platforms or Jen Harper on LinkedIn. Um, and then we're at Cheekbone Beauty on all the social platforms. This Wonderful. was so fun. This was fun. I learned a lot. And thank you so much, uh, really, for, for stopping by. I'm sure our audience has learned a lot as well. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. And everybody else, uh, we'll see you on B1. Mm-hmm.